Hello and welcome back to Bookish and welcome to uh, video number two about section two of The Sound and the Fury. This section is titled, I forgot to pull my sticky note, June 2nd, uh, 1910. Uh, this section is all about Quentin Thompson and so my, my notes right here I wrote uh, poor Quentin uh, there. Uh, for those of you uh, hoping to get a break from the stream of consciousness and to be able to you know, sort things out more simply. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the Quentin section is in many ways, I think, more difficult uh, than the Benji section. There is a, a similar jumping around, only uh, I think it's easier to see exactly what's happening and the jump cuts aren't quite so quick. But I will say, even having said that, there are occasions, uh, I think this is my fourth time, I think, uh, reading this novel. There are still occasions in which I'm not exactly sure where we are in time, even in Quentin's section. And if you haven't picked up on this, and this is your first Faulkner read, let me just tell you, Faulkner plays with time. Uh, time is hardly ever linear uh, in uh, Faulkner's major works. There's a lot of flashing back and flashing forward and all kinds of stuff like that. So this section is potentially, I think, as confusing uh, as the Benji section. And this is frustrating because we know that Benji, Benji is mentally handicapped, and so we look forward to uh, this section. Uh, you know, even if we know know it's stream of consciousness, we look forward to this section of being uh, perhaps more rational. And it really isn't uh, because Quentin Thompson is obsessed. He is, uh, you know, incredibly high strung. He is obsessed with uh, lots of things and he is uh, he is not uh, necessarily mentally well I think as is obvious by what he's preparing to do so this section I think is really challenging but also I think it's like the Benji section incredibly important for what it reveals in lots of places so I just want to talk about some of the things I think are the major themes elements uh, in this section and the first one is time uh, so time here in this section is represented right away uh, by the watch that Quentin has. Uh, and this is a watch that he was given uh, by his father. And I want to talk more about his father later, but I'm just going to read you the quote um, from Quentin's father, Jason Thompson III, when he gave him the watch. It was grandfather's, and when father gave it to me, he said, I give you the mausoleum of all hope and desire. It's rather excruciatingly apt that you will use it to gain the reducto absurdum of all human experience, which can fit your individual needs no better than it fitted his or his father's. I give it to you not that you may remember time, but that you might forget it now and then for a moment and not spend all your breath trying to conquer it. Because no battle is ever won, he said. They are not even fought. The field only reveals to a man his folly and his despair. And victory is an illusion of philosophers and fools. <laughs> That's like literally the first paragraph of this section. And that tells you a whole lot of things. Uh, and like I said, some of it is about uh, Quentin's father, which I'll get to a little bit later on. But he kind of dooms Quentin to uh, obsess about time here. Uh, he says he hopes that Quentin won't obsess with time. And then when we read this section, we find out that he, Quentin clearly is. Quentin tries to break this obsession, I suppose, by breaking the watch itself, he breaks the glass, uh, he pulls uh, the uh, hands off the watch so he can't tell what time it is, but despite that we know Quentin is keeping track of time. If you think about it, just go back and think about how many times Quentin is figuring out what time it is by the ringing the bells, by the shadow uh, on his floor, uh, you know, he's figuring out all the time what time it is and he's measuring out the time on this day for a really specific reason, which I think you probably picked up on uh, as you were reading. But it's not the future that Quentin is obsessed with. You know, in some ways, by pulling the hands off the watch, I think it indicates that Quentin knows he has no future. It's the past that Quentin is really obsessed with. He's obsessed with the timing of this one day, the day uh, in which the action uh, takes place. Uh, but he's more obsessed with what's happened before. He's more obsessed with his family history and his relationship with his sister and all those kinds of things. That is what he's obsessed with. And his past and the events of his past intrude on his present all the time. They are constantly there. There are constant reminders uh, of, his, of his past. I also think it's interesting that he takes the watch to a, a watch repair, repair place to see if it can be fixed. Uh, and he doesn't leave the watch there to be fixed, but he is happy to know that it can be, that it can be repaired, 
that this mausoleum of failure, in a sense, that his father has gifted him can be fixed. And I think that's what Quentin wants more than anything else, uh, to fix things. Um, as the oldest child, maybe that's just, you know, uh, part of the nature of being the oldest child. I also want to talk about, as I indicated here, uh, about Quentin's uh, father. Uh, as the quote indicated, as the quote I read about the watch indicates, Quentin's father is completely defeated. He is deteriorating. He's depressed. He is an alcoholic. He's drinking. He doesn't see the point of life. He doesn't see the point of fighting or trying. Uh, he just believes that life is about defeat and life is about failure and death. And anyone who doesn't see that is a fool, uh, which is a pretty awful thing to say uh, to your son uh, as you're about to send him off to college, I suppose, or as you're giving him uh, his grandfather's watch. Another idea that Quentin gets from his dad is that women are essentially no good. Uh, and Quentin, dad, uh, Quentin remembers his dad saying the following. Women are like that. They don't acquire knowledge of people. We are for that. They are, for, they are just born with a practical fertility of suspicion that makes a crop every so often and usually, right, and usually right. They have an affinity for evil, for supplying whatever the evil lacks in itself, for drawing it about them instinctively as you, as you do bed clothing in, slum, in slumber, fertilizing the mind for, for it until the evil has served its purpose, whether it ever existed or no. So that's a pretty misogynist statement uh, that Quentin's dad makes about women, which, you know, brings up, you know, clearly the relationship between Quentin's mother and father uh, is toxic by this point. So Jason Combs III has kind of given up, and he's given up in the midst of this decline and deterioration of his family, uh, of his marriage uh, to Quentin's mother, of uh, his, the strain that his brother-in-law, Maury, puts on that um, on their relationship, of the problems he has with his own kids, uh, not really liking Jason and Benji's mental uh, handicap and uh, Caddy's promiscuity, which I promise we'll get to. Uh, and so that Quentin is really the only person he relates to the most, and Quentin relates most to his dad. Uh, Quentin is a Southern traditionalist. He believes in the tradition of the South, and I think uh, Faulkner really brings this home to us in, in, a, in a quite brutal way by exposing us to Quentin's racism because Quentin says some pretty vile racist things and he has some racist ideas which kind of center around I guess this porter who works at their dorm or the play at roomy house where they live uh, this African-American man who participates in parades and dressed as a uniform who Quentin is kind of mocking and he is contrasting um, African-Americans in the north with African-Americans in the south uh, in an incredibly racist way. And so we know that Quentin has the racist ideas of the Old South, and we presume uh, that his father does too, based on some of the things uh, in, in the Benji section. We also know that Quentin, and we also will learn, that Quentin believes in family honor, uh, that Southern men fight for uh, their family honor, and they will uphold that honor, and that family name is incredibly important. He is a traditionalist in that way. He is committed to these ideas, to preserving uh, the South's <clears throat> glorious past and his family's uh, glorious past and his family's honor. And this is kind of one of those things that, that really, uh, I think, goes to the heart of who Quentin is uh, and what Quentin's up to uh, most of the time. So, having said that, that, you know, from Quentin's point of view, a Southern man fights for his family's honor, then most of what this section is really about, it's about Quentin's failure to do exactly that, that Quentin doesn't do the thing that he believes a Southern man is supposed to do to protect his family, in this case, to protect his sister, who he focuses most of, the ten most of his attention on. So, Caddy is promiscuous, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk, I have an idea about this, uh, which I'll talk about uh, near the end of the video. Uh, but Caddy's promiscuity is a real problem for Quentin because it threatens the, the family honor, and he knows it's his responsibility to do something about this. So when Quentin catches uh, Caddy with uh, adult names, and he sees them having sex, he literally refers to the beast with two backs uh, at one point, and... Uh, and her promiscuity and the fact that she's lost her, her virginity becomes known, Quentin decides it's his job to fight Dalton names. He meets him, he calls him out, he tells him to meet, meet him in a certain place, 
he goes to that place, which is a bridge. By the way, bridges and water and bodies of water play an important role uh, symbolically, <clears throat> I think, in this section. He goes to that place to more or less threaten Dalton Ames and tell him he has to get out of town, and he fails miserably. Uh, Dalton Ames gives him a gun. Uh, and teach him how to shoot it because Dalton Ames is not afraid of Quentin at all. When Quentin tries to strike Dalton Ames, uh, Ames grabs him by the wrist and overpowers him, and Quentin actually kind of passes out. Uh, and he fails in every way possible to, to stand up for his sister. To make matters worse, his sister shows up uh, and more or less dismisses Dalton Ames from her life and tries to take care of him, which, by the way, also uh, really emasculating. You know... There are also several scenes that are really disturbing in this when you read it, in which Quentin threatens to kill Caddy. He talks about being stronger than her, and there's one scene where he actually is holding a knife uh, to Caddy's neck. And she's more or less saying, yeah, okay, go ahead and kill me. And he's kind of doing, this would be kind of like an honor killing, that, you know, he's going to kill Caddy to preserve the honor of his family. He can't kill Dalton Ames, so, you know, he can perhaps kill Caddy, and that will, uh, you know, eliminate this blight. Uh, from the family uh, honor, this kind of besmirching of the family honor, but he can't bring himself to do that, to do that either. Uh, he fails to protect uh, Caddy from Herbert uh, Head, uh, who will be her fiance and the man who, who she marries after she find, finds out uh, that she's pregnant. Uh, he, in a really confusing part, and this is something I'm actually not clear about, at one point apparently Quentin fires a gun through the floor of Caddy's room after hearing uh, Herbert uh, Head's voice down below. And it's not clear if he was trying to kill uh, Herbert, or perhaps this is, you know, Quentin's first suicide attempt. At any rate, <clears throat> Herbert and Quentin have a confrontation that is somewhat similar to uh, the confrontation he had with uh, Dalton Ames, and just like he couldn't scare off uh, Dalton Ames, he can't scare, scare off uh, he can't scare off Herbert Head. Uh, he's not going to leave either. And this, then, is also the, the point where I think the most disturbing aspects, if you read this, uh, this section of the section, come up, and that is that Quentin is constantly suggesting that they change the story of what happened to Caddy to the fact that uh, he had committed incest. He decides in his mind that if... He changes the story from Caddy being promiscuous to Caddy being the victim of an incestuous um, attack by him of some kind, or some kind of an incestuous relationship between he and his sister, that this kind of horrifying news would kind of blot out everything else uh, about the family, and that somehow, by kind of cauterizing the wound, uh, by taking extreme measures to end people talking about Caddy's promiscuity and change to talking about incest, which he uh, would bear the primary responsibility for, that that would save the family honor name. Now, you should know, and, and that, that's incredibly foolish to think that one thing is better than the other, but that's how driven he is to try to do something about it. He feels like it's his responsibility to do something to save the family name, even if that means committing this kind of incredibly horrible thing or just convincing people. Uh, that he's convinced this incredibly, he's done this incredibly horrible thing to kind of wipe out the idea that his sister is just sexually promiscuous, uh, that one would be better than the other. And he's going to try to convince Caddy, and he tries to convince his dad, and that doesn't take place either. So notice, again, he fails, and Quentin fails every time he tries to protect Caddy. He fails. This, he's reminded of this failure by, I think, you know, one of the funniest or kind of, kind of a humorous scene in this section. And that is when that little girl that he meets at the bread shop, I guess, follows him around. Uh, he can't get rid of her. You know, he's been really nice to her. He calls her sister. And that's why we have all these connections in this section is where we see Quentin flashing back to his conversations with Caddy about her promiscuity, about this incest idea. Um that this kind of whole scene with the little girl plays itself out. In the end, he, he is accused of kidnapping uh, this little girl by her, her brother. And her brother attacks Quentin and knocks him down. And, you know, he has to go to court to more or less buy his way out of it. But notice that the little girl's brother did the thing that Quentin couldn't do. He physically attacks Quentin. He st stands up for his sister's honor. And this has to then remind Quentin that he couldn't do it. This explains why... 
when Quentin is on uh, his way back to to Cambridge in Gerald's car with Gerald's mother and Shreve and uh, Spode are all in the car, and I believe there are a couple of girls in the car. This explains why I think in thinking about the story, Quentin begins to laugh kind of maniacally because he again is reminded of this failure, and then Quentin will go on uh, and fight uh, Gerald. Uh, Gerald is a known womanizer, uh, and his mom is actually proud of his womanizing. Uh, and I believe in the scene in the car, we see uh, Quentin saying, you know, you never had a sister. If you've never had a sister, you wouldn't understand kind of a thing. And then he fights Gerald, and I think by fighting Gerald, even though that fight is described relatively humorously, I think, uh, where Quentin says, well, did I at least hit him? And they said, oh, yeah, you hit him. And then Quentin's like, well, I wish I could have at least bled on him a little bit. And he asks at one point, like, where did Gerald learn to box? And they tell him all. Anyway, I find that scene funny. But Quentin here is kind of feels like he's finally satisfied uh, that need to stick up for the honor of women, even if it's not for his own sister, for uh, women in general. So I think that that explains a lot about why Quentin is so unhappy why he's depressed, why he's going to take the act that he's going to take. So then that brings me, though, then, to talking about this issue of incest. Incest is, in lots of ways, at the heart of, you know, um, the sound and the fury. And primarily, the incest, or the proposed incest, the potential incest that we see, is between Quentin and Caddy, but I would suggest that there are hints uh, about another incestuous relationship uh, within that uh, family. But let's just talk about Quentin and Caddy uh, here because I think that's that's a really important part because we learn a lot about Caddy. You know, we learn kind of general impressions as you expect to learn from the Benji section, but here we learn a lot more specific things, uh, primarily about Quentin, uh, about Quentin's father, Jason Thompson III, and about Caddy. So there is some kind of mutual attraction that exists uh, between Caddy and Quentin. And I realize this may seem controversial to suggest that Caddy is attracted to Quentin as well, but I, I think that it's actually perfectly normal in that Quentin is her older brother and she idolizes him. And in some ways, then that creates this attraction. And I think clearly Quentin after a really kind of important event, uh, begins to be to feel somewhat more physically uh, attracted and be aware of his sister's physicality, I guess, uh, in this section as well. So, so talking about how this kind of all plays itself out, there's a really important scene that takes place in a barn. Quentin has gone to the barn with a girl named Natalie, who is known to be relatively easy in the community uh, in which they live. She may not be very attractive, but from Quentin's point of view, you know, he's essentially gone to the barn looking to lose his virginity uh, to this Natalie person. And surprisingly, uh, Caddy shows up in the barn and sees them. And she is clearly angry and jealous about what's happened. Uh, and, you know, how could you do this with, you know, uh, a dirty girl like uh, this Natalie? And Natalie gets kind of freaked out and runs off. Quentin is mad. He stomps up and down in the mud. Uh, he tries to lie to Quentin, uh, and he tries to lie to Caddy and tell her that they weren't really having sex, that he was just hugging her. Caddy won't believe him. Quentin is covered in stinky mud. He more or less grabs Caddy and rubs mud all over her. She scratches his face, and later they go down uh, to the branch of the creek to wash themselves off. Uh, and it's in this moment, there's something ch sexually charged about that mud scene and the, the scene of her cleaning the mud off, which will, will be also, by the way, repeated uh, in the uh, aftermath of the Dalt Names uh, episode. Um, but Caddy is clearly je jealous of Quentin here, uh, and Quentin understands that. He knows, and Quentin will more or less stay a virgin because I think of Caddy's disapproval. Um, that Caddy has some kind of power hold over him. He has this need to continue their relationship. Maybe he has, you know, uh, sexual attraction to his sister. Whatever it is, he's going to remain a virgin. As a matter of fact, he's teased about it uh, by his college friends. So then, when uh, when when Quentin catches Caddy uh, with Dalt names, that's when you know we see these first scenes where you know he asks her and and she says essentially, you know. Uh, you know, why did you do it? And, you know, do you like him? And she says, as soon as he touched me, I died, 
which is interesting to think uh, that she was not uh, enjoying her promiscuity at all, that it was in some ways killing her again, maybe because it wasn't the person that she was most attracted to. It's here where we see Quentin threatening to kill her. Now, is he threatening to kill her out of jealousy or is he threatening to kill her to maintain the family honor? Uh, when he meets uh, Caddy's fiance, uh, Herbert Head, later on, Herbert says, uh, tells him that, wow, you look kind of like a girl, uh, suggesting there is a physical resemblance between uh, Caddy and uh, Quentin, perhaps, and that he's not uh, particularly masculine. And then he says, you know, Caddy talked about you so much, I thought you must be her boyfriend and not her, her brother. And he was a little bit, uh, he was a little bit jealous uh, about that. So this kind of, uh, this kind of situation, this weird relationship between Caddy and, and Quentin is, is kind of hard to explain. And it is, you know, I think uh, definitely disturbing in lots of ways. Uh, and you know, I, I I have a feeling that the that the attraction there is uh, somewhat uh, mutual. Uh, when um, when Quentin is telling his dad um, about his plan and trying to convince his dad that this whole incest plan thing would be right, his dad at one point asks him if they actually did it. Quentin's dad says, "I think you're too serious to give me any cause for alarm. You wouldn't have felt driven to the expedient of telling me you had committed incest otherwise." And I. I wasn't lying. I wasn't lying. And he, you wanted to sublimate a piece of natural human folly into a horror and then exercise it with truth. And I, it was to isolate her out of the loud world so that it would, so that it would have to flee us of necessity. And the sound of it would be as though it had never been. And, and he, did you try to make her do it? And I, I was afraid to. I was afraid she might. And then it wouldn't have done any good. In other words, it's one point, you know, his dad says, did you actually try to make your sister have sex with you? And Quentin says, I didn't try because I was afraid she might. So, you know, this again leads to the possibility that perhaps Quint perhaps Caddy does have these feelings towards her brother. And it may just be that she wants to, you know, just like she wants to keep Benji happy, that she wants to keep Quentin happy as well. But I do think there's something more to that. So this then brings me to, to kind of the, the, the last issue I have. And that is uh, Caddy's promiscuity. Why is Caddy promiscuous? She is disapproving of Quentin and his attempt to have sex with Natalie. And then almost, you know, as soon as possible after that, she becomes really sexually active. There's Charlie, there's Dalton, there's Herbert Head. Quentin asks her, were there many? She says, there were too many. Uh, she doesn't seem to enjoy the promiscuity. She says, you know, when they touched me, I died. Or when it happened, I died. Um, so what is she doing? Why is she pursuing this uh, sexual promiscuity? At one point, she says something to Quentin to kind of indicate to him um, why. And here's that quote. There was something terrible in me sometimes at night. I could see it grinning at me. I could see it through through them grinning at me through their faces. It's gone now and I'm sick. So what he wants to know is, you know, what, what is she seeing uh, in, these, in these men? What is it uh, that is, you know, scaring her that has now been fixed apparently uh, by her pregnancy? Uh, and what is the explanation for promiscuity? And my explanation, my theory is that this is how Caddy is going to break free of the family. That Quentin is committed to the family and preserving the family honor, and Caddy sees that there is nothing but destruction in that. <clears throat> she recognizes in her own family pattern, her father, her mother, her uncle Maury, a pattern she doesn't want to repeat herself, Quentin, her, Jason. She doesn't want to repeat that pattern. Uh, perhaps that pattern is an incestuous one, which I'll talk about hopefully again later, but she wants to break free, and being a young woman, in the South, there aren't very many ways in which she can break free other than to become promiscuous, to ruin her reputation, uh, to get pregnant, to be forced into a marriage that will take her away, that will free her from uh, that society and free her from her family so that she can have a chance to live freely. Does she have to, in some ways, then abandon Quentin and abandon Benji and abandon her father? Yes, uh, but she is going to do that. Uh, in an attempt to have some life of her own. <clears throat> that won't necessarily work out as well as she wants. But I think that's what she's up to. At least that's, that's my theory. And Quentin's inability to prevent her from doing that, his inability to fight for the family honor, even his inability to kind of sell this 
incest story to Caddy or to his father. Uh, all of that fails. Uh, and because he fails in his duty as a Southern gentleman and in his duty to his family, this is why Quentin kills himself. Those last two things, the reason for Caddy's promiscuity and Quentin, the reason for Quentin's suicide, uh, are theories of my own, but I, I don't think they're particularly original, but I'm also not sure that they're 100% accurate. Anyway, there you go. Uh, hopefully I got everything in the Quentin section I wanted to say and I didn't make too many mistakes. Um, look forward to your comments in the comment section below. Hope you're enjoy still enjoying the reading. <clears throat> Things get clearer as we go on in the book uh, through the next section and the last section. Uh, look forward to your comments in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.